So again, welcome everyone to the artist talk for Around Town with Joy Mackin and Contemplations with Lee Blanchard, Karen Gibbons, and David Stock, which is up through April 24th. And we're just taking a look at some of the installation shots now. Are we, okay. I think you're muted, Susan, sorry. Shall I go ahead with? Okay, so um, we're gonna start with Joy. Congratulations on a beautiful show, Joy. Thank you for being here today to talk with us. Um, I just wanted to share that I've been finding it so reviving to see these vibrant watercolors emerging during this period of time when we've often struggled to emerge ourselves. Um, I was wondering, can you tell us to start just why you call the show Around Town? Sure, for a very similar reason. Um, basically the past two years, all I could do was stick around town. Um, between the pandemic and I had some orthopedic issues going on, I. I stayed within my neighborhood for the most part, occasionally going into Manhattan when I could, but uh, it really put a different kind of limit on where I could go to find images to paint. And um, I explored a lot of things just in my immediate walking distance. Sometimes like these small skies, they were in the park nearby or often I would just go out and stand on my front porch and find some inspiration for some things to paint. So around town, um, I sort of saw myself still as the ultimate New Yorker, you know, I could still get around and do things. Um, and I, I sort of liked the title, sort of felt like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers a little bit uh, around town and, and just uh, urban and, and making do with what you got. Yeah. Well, the result has been such a beautiful show, so we're really lucky to benefit from that. Um, how do you decide what to paint? I spend a lot of time thinking about what I want to paint. Um, I walk around, walk around with my camera, and I'm always looking at things, um, especially if it's a nice sunny day. But I also enjoy going out when it's a little cloudy or if it's snowy. Um, Sometimes I know right away, sometimes the, the combination of the light, which is usually what attracts me the most, it, it grabs me and, and I can find what I wanna paint. And otherwise, sometimes I have to struggle with it a little bit more to find some images. Often I'm back in my studio going through a lot of photographs that I've taken and I could take a few hundred photographs at a time, just trying to find one thing that, that excites me and, and just has, enough interest. Sometimes it's something that's very going to be very hard to paint. I just kind of challenge myself with that. Other times it's just something that is incredibly beautiful and, and it has a lot of color and depth in it, a lot of spatial um, features to it that I enjoy painting. And um, that's what makes the, the ideal subject for me. What, what else? What else is important to each painting, would you say? Um, I have to really like love the subject matter. I have to really be attracted to it to, to really want to spend a lot of time on it because these paintings will take a few weeks for the most part to paint. Um, I don't always know that it's doable. Sometimes I get myself into trouble and I, I, I kind of enjoy that. How, how am I going to make this work? But um, it, it's mostly the light that I'm attracted to. And a lot of things that define the light is often the shadows. They become shapes that I can paint. Um, it defines the space in a landscape, for example. Um, it, it defines the forms uh, and it gives some substance to the painting in that regard. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this small sky series? like how it came about. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I did the small skies in the month of January of this year. And January for me, and I think a lot of people, it was, it was a pretty rough season, mostly with um, 
COVID going on. You know, I think it was just a lot of scariness going on and, and I was finding it hard to concentrate. I was finding it hard to, to get up in the morning and, and work in my studio. I didn't, I didn't really have anything I wanted to paint, but I've been thinking a lot about skies and I've been collecting a lot of photographs over the years of skies. Um, so I decided to do a painting every two days, which for me is um, very fast because usually my paintings can take anywhere from two weeks to six weeks to do. But every two days I would start a painting and finish it. And then the next day I'd start another one and finish it. And I did 14 of these on a small scale. They're, they're, they're quite small for, for me. And um, it was very freeing. It was a lot of fun. Um, I was able to kind of knock them out pretty fast and, and experiment a little bit with them, be a little looser with my brush strokes and the color. And um, I ended up with a series of 14 that were kind of, you know, they all held together quite nicely and, and they were a lot of fun to do. Um, and I'm also done with them. <laughs> I don't like work, I, they're too small for me actually. I, I prefer to work larger. Um, I, I think I've got it out of my system. Maybe I'll go back to them someday, but um, they were fun to do. I'm glad I did them and um, I'm moving on, yeah. Um, one thing that stands out in a lot of your work, I think, is Horizon and where you've like, chosen to place it. Are you able to talk a little bit about how, how Horizon is important? Maybe sure. Um, one in particular, but yeah, I was thinking This of. is one, I know you, we had talked about this. Um, I'm very aware of where the sky meets the land. And as a landscape artist, I'm always kind of looking at that relationship and how it composes within a rectangle of a sheet of paper. Uh, where it goes and, and, and how the, the various tones of the sky versus the land often determine the overall color and feel of the entire painting also. So I'm, I'm, I'm always aware of that. I'm always looking at that. Um, as someone who's always looking at the sky, the horizon is usually there. Um, so that does become a, a component of my painting. And also, um, for example, in this one, it was a chance to really do some um, depth of field to experiment with things that are in focus and sharp against things that are um, blurry and in the background to give a real spatial sense to it, which is another thing that I like to work with on that. And that's why this one, for example, became so much fun to do. This is Wave Hill up in the Bronx. And what we're looking at in the background is are the Palisades in New Jersey. Uh, along the sky. So it was a really nice relationship to, to work with in, in this. Um, a lot of my work, uh, my work is very classic in that regard. I, I, you know, it's still based on uh, principles of drawing and composition that I bring into um, the paintings, but I do like to throw in surprises with it too by how it composes and maybe, you know, things aren't always lined up, things crop off, um, shapes are determined by uh, shadows in a lot of cases. Those are all kind of things that I work with. Could you go back one, Susan, or sorry, two to the painting of the building? I, I remember you said something about surprises in this one too. Are you able to talk about that? This is yeah. This is a a, a slightly different um, thing for me. I was walking around. I didn't have anything I wanted to paint, and I was just walking around the neighborhood taking a lot of pictures and um, this attract, I was really attracted to the light on this building. I, I passed this building all the time and didn't really notice it until then. And um, it wasn't until I got back to my studio and was looking at the photographs that I saw the Black Lives Matter sign in the window. And for me, that, that just brought this into a whole other um, realm of a, of a painting that it was very timely, not even, it wasn't just about, you know, me walking around looking for things to paint. It, it really be, spoke to me personally about um, what was going on in the world. It was also a very challenging painting to paint, which I liked, I, I enjoyed that. But um, I felt that this went beyond just, you know, being a pretty painting at that stage, that it became something that um, had, it was, a real, it was a real marker of the time because of the Black Lives Matter sign. And I also made the decision to um, have the Black Lives Matter be the only white in the painting. 
Uh, that's the only white of the paper that shows in this one. Uh, everything else in the painting has been tinted in a certain way. So I, I wanted to put the emphasis on that too. And it's really about that, you know, we have such beautiful things in our lives often, and, and I try and capture that in my work. But we also have to remember that in our life, there, there's, there's such awfulness going on and unpleasantness sometimes that we have to bring that in and acknowledge that also. So I think for me, this, this had a little bit of a twist on it. Yeah. Thank you. And again, if, if we have um, questions for Joy, we have a chance at the end. So thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to move on to the show contemplations that's in the project space. I think we have some installation shots for this one as well. So we can start with David. Um, David, congratulations on your showing in contemplations. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you for being here. Um, these pieces approach the interplay between abstract and representational with such beautiful specificity. I'm wondering how you see them as connected to the theme of the show of contemplation. Um, well, as a photographer, um, this kind of abstract photography uh, involves a lot of contemplation. I have to be really open to what's in my visual environment and how it resonates with me emotionally. Um, and it's kind of a long process going from uh, taking the picture to realizing it as a print. It goes through a lot of stages. But then, you know, for the viewers, I'm hoping when things work right, that a viewer will take some time and kind of sink into the, um, uh, the photograph and maybe find some emotional resonance in it for themselves. So it's kind of like, uh, um, there's a certain amount of meditation on both ends, both me as a photographer and hopefully for the viewers. Yeah, I think that really does come across a bit of like an emotional abstraction. Um, sorry, I think we're going back. <laughs> We'll be back. Oh, okay. I'm having some technical difficulties. Oh, we're going to start the share again. Sorry. Thank you. It's okay. Take your time. I'm getting the quick. I hear those clicks. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's just as beautiful another time around. Oops, okay. <laughs> Going back. Oh, wait, these weren't the. Okay. Yeah, here you go. Great. Thank you. Um, so, David, it's clear from looking at these that surface plays an important role. Can you talk about what you're looking for in the surface? Um, well, a lot of times, um, something just jumps out at me. So instead of me finding it, it kind of finds me, um, I'm often doing another kind of photography when I see these situations and I'm sort of, I'm looking at the world a lot through the rectangle in my mind that, that I know, uh, will make a print in the end and that the the camera will impose on the subject. 
and I see something that will just fit into that frame and make a new image, a new object. So usually I'm, I'm grabbed right away with it. Um, as far as where that happens, um, a lot of the times it's in between subjects. Like uh, a lot of these are in between two storefronts where different textures or uh, colors meet, where there are utilities or, or graffiti or oddball shadows. Um, and a lot of them are also around the corner. Like, uh, you know, if you're walking down a busy commercial street and then you turn on to a, go around the corner, you find these, um, you know, electrical uh, conduits and stuff for the fire department and these um, changes in texture from one, from the commercial to the residential or whatever. So those are, those are situations where I often find uh, this kind of subject. Right, yeah, texture is maybe even a better word than surface. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the dimensionality of the photographs and how shadow, which is often used to make an object more three-dimensional and like representing an object um, is sometimes used here to push the image further into an abstraction instead. And I'm wondering if that's something you're consciously exploring or how you think about that. Well, I hadn't really thought about it that much. Um, there's one of these where there's a photograph of a, a, a shadow of a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could look at that. Yeah. But I actually, I think that's a really good point. Um, um, a lot of times the shadows are part of the composition and um, an element in their own right, more than being used to um, define something else. And, and I, like, I like that little switch up. Um, yeah. I like making the shadows um, a graphic element in their, in their own right. I think it adds a little bit of ambiguity to the images. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, could we go to the photograph that's called homage? Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you would just tell us, is it an homage to someone or something that you wanted to share? Yes, this is an homage to um, someone who is a real mentor to me, Aaron Siskind, who is a great abstract photographer, um, worked in black and white, but he, um, he used to photograph peeling paint and walls and textures close up and make uh, beautiful uh, abstract images. He, was, um, he hung out with the abstract expressionist painters in New York and considered himself an abstract expressionist. And he was a big influence on me. Thank you. Um, and we could yeah, move forward with Karen. Um, Karen, congratulations. Uh, I'm very drawn to the gentle tension between segmentation of the panels and this piece and the unification of the overall image um, and how it's been painted. I know much of your work is contemplative at the core and explores themes such as healing and transformation. And I wonder whether you experience the process of painting itself as contemplative and or transform transformative healing, et cetera. Um, yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Kay. And Kay, thank you for uh, taking over the moderation so gracefully, appreciate it. Um, so uh, yes, I think um, I've always um, found making art healing and um, uh, so much so that I became an art therapist and um, I share that uh, <clears throat> aspect of art making with other people. And um, I think that um, what I'm really drawn to with the um, 
with the creating um, multiple layers and multiple um, shapes that come together, um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, finding balance always mm -hmm. and finding balance between um, our like physical nature and our spiritual nature or finding balance between um, what's solid and what's ephemeral and, um, and then uh, finding balance with what is already there as a sort of given and then how I manipulate it to, um, to make it have um, what I sometimes call a near narrative that is, um, it starts to tell a story, but um, I really want it to be uh, open-ended so that it's what um, whatever the viewer brings to it as well, because I even find I bring different things to um, the imagery every time I look at it. And, um, uh, and this piece uh, has the potential to and and anyone that's made of with different sections to be to move them around, and um, I um, <laughs> yeah well I might as well tell about this now. So um, Fred Bendheim, the uh, picture credit to Fred, um, uh, included this piece in a show that he had, and um, and this is how he hung it, and. Um, you know, even though I imagined it could be hung in any way, in any configuration, I was surprised to see it <laughs> hung like this. And um, <laughs> so I send him the picture of how I had last hung it. Um, but I really, it feels refreshing. And so like, if you purchase this piece, you could hang it however you want. You could hang it different ways on different days. And, um, and then the narrative changes a little bit. And um, the... Uh, relationships change and uh, but I've noticed since the pandemic I'm still making things in these multiple ways but um, I'm much more drawn to keeping them the way that I drew it <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, actually I did just do a piece that I really prefer it mixed up and um, but um, uh, it uh, I had a show at um, about a year ago and I called it Choose Your Own Adventure because all the pieces were, um, had multiples that could potentially be re rearranged. So even just the potential to me is part of that transformation. I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. Um, I know that memory plays a role in your process. I was wondering, are you painting from memory when you're painting the animals? Or... Um, that's a good question. Uh, the animals that I'm drawn to, I always like to have some um, real life connection to. And uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not necessarily drawing the animal from memory. I usually use some kind of reference to make sure they're proportioned correctly or um, if that is important in the piece. Um, and um, this particular piece, I was working on it um, in the country and I was outside on the porch and I had my four panels that I was thinking of as representing the elements with the, um, the and they were found panels um, and the, they were red, yellow, blue and green. And, um, and I was imagining that I wanted an animal um, to dominate the composition. And um, in that uh, feeling very connected to nature and, and also wanting an animal at, for that connection to like instinct mm -hmm. and, um, and symbolism. Uh, but anyway, the, um, <clears throat> a, a fawn came by and just stopped and looked at me while I was um, contemplating what to do for this piece. And um, I was like, oh, maybe that's the thing. And um, so I started looking at pictures of um, bonds and drawing, sketching them. And then it happened again, the next day, it came by the same spot. 
and just stood and hung out with me for a while. And I was like, okay, yep, this is it. So in a way, this had a direct connection, but I also just like um, the symbolism of the fawn and uh, for, you know, how things are going around this time, I always, it, it always has to do with like what's present for me um, and hopefully what's present for others in the world. And, um, and a fawn to symbolically represents innocence, gentleness, um, purity, and um, peacefulness. So just looking for those qualities. And I also feel like um, when you choose like a baby animal, you're choosing to kind of look at that um, younger aspect of yourself or, um, you know, just pointing to, you know, what does our child self have to, how can that inform us? Um, and so, and that's part of the memory. Like we're always in the present, but we form our future by uh, what's happened in the past, but our memory distorts everything. So it's interesting to me, like how I choose to distort the memory and how to, um, uh, you know, what elements I choose each time as a, um, as sort of memory elements. And um, most of them got obscured in this piece, actually, because that um, the deer image was so compelling for me. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the story of the found boards? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, historically, I am um, was trained as a painter. Um, my paintings gradually became kind of three-dimensional wall pieces. And then I made a lot of sculpture um, that, that was always painted. So my roots in painting kind of stayed, but um, I would use found objects as a kind of armature and stretch nylon fabric over it. Then I could um, gesso the fabric and paint that so that the vestiges of the found object would show through and, and be part of the, the kind of memory or the, or the symbolism or just the um, energy of the piece. And um, uh, as my studio filled up with sculpture and not that many people have space for sculpture in their, especially New York City apartments, um, I started thinking maybe I should go back to 2D. <laughs> so um, for a while now I've been working two-dimensionally, but I still am drawn to having that object quality, which um, to me means a um, sense of something existing as an object at the same time um, as, as having that illusionistic space. So, you know, if you're only interested in the illusionistic space, you don't need to use birch boards that have this dimension to them. But mm -hmm. I love to to have that to start out with. And then even more, I love it if it already has something that I'm kind of playing off of to start out with. So when I came to my new studio uh, now two years ago, but um, uh, someone was selling a whole bunch of birch boards that already had stuff on them. So they were like incomplete paintings, maybe some complete paintings. And um, I, uh, I, so I bought the whole lot of them. And they were from like 36 by 36 to uh, little 12 by 12 or nine by 12. Anyway, um, I sadly now come to the end of them, but this was four that were the same size, but, and they had these colors. So um, I wouldn't normally be drawn to using uh, uh, primary colors, but I like the connection I was feeling to the elements. And uh, so uh, earth, fire, water, and air. And, um, uh, and then they all had some kind of type on them. And so some of it remains and some of it is obscured. And that has to do with just um, uh, the process as I go along, what, um, what works in the, that balance I was talking about to, and so it's not even in a way, I feel like it's not under my control. Like I, you know, I wanted to keep in the um, 
top right in this configuration, it said uh, humans unite. And to me, that was like, oh, this is exactly what we need right now. <laughs> but it, it couldn't stay. So you can only vaguely see yeah. humans unite there. <laughs> But then that's um, interesting to me too. Like it's it's embedded in the painting, and not necessarily, um, you know, overtly um, present. But you know, in the in the layers of memory that are embedded in this painting. And folks who have seen the show will know that this is you know from the door such a. Um, a resting image on its own and then when you get up close to it there's all these little details that you wouldn't have expected and little stories that are started and you know in the writing so it's really definitely go go see it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is a different thing in person for sure yeah thank you thanks Kay. and lastly we have lee blanchard Hi, Lee. Thank Hello. you for being here. And um, congratulations on your showing and contemplations. Thank you. Um, thank you. These images communicate so much deep emotion with such a like beautifully quiet tone. Uh, and I know there's a strong connection here, not just to memory, but more specifically to the fading of memory. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, yeah. So um, I related a lot to what Karen was just Thing about distorted memory. I think there's a lot similarity there with this series. Um, it was actually kind of a healing process for me of getting over a, a passing of a, of a pet that um, puppy named Grover and he, he passed a little too soon and um, it was really hard. And I had been wanting to make some work for a while and it just felt you didn't want to force it. And after it had been about two years and it just felt like, um, I was thinking a lot about the memories and how they distort and change over time, but in not, in, in not such a bad way, it becomes almost like you're just left with, um, kind of an essence, like a feeling of just these strong emotions instead of, you know, feeling like everything is really clear and really there. Um, so it, yeah, it ties well with the, um, with contemplations. It was, that was the whole kind of, um, inspiration for the series. Thank you. Can you speak a little bit about the process of, of assembling the images themselves? Yeah, sure. So, um, these pieces, um, we're all, they're all photographs and they're kind of using that like distortion of the original uh, image of the, of what was originally there and kind of that fading. And um, it feels a little like a dream and a little like a, um, a faded memory. And I, I printed out a bunch of images and kind of wasn't sure exactly what, what to do with them. Um, and I felt like some images just felt like one strong essence, like one strong memory. And I, I wanted to have those on their own. Um, and others felt like they belong together. Like they almost kind of told a little memory story, like little, you get little glimpses here and there and little, and together they kind of build upon each other. So, um, so the process was just sitting surrounded by a lot of little photographs and kind of deciding, um, what to do and where to put them and, and how they balance one another. And um, the, the title is, um, is um, Everything Wondrous is Endless. Uh, it's the title of the series. And I, I felt a, a kind of a, a, a connection with that, just that string of words and kind of it ties to, um, you know, my feeling about the passing and, and moving on and also just a little bit the feeling of the, like the process of even creating the work. Like it, there was a, a lot of kind of discovery and like wonder to putting things together and creating something new that, um, that it just felt like it tied to both. And I wanted to, 
you know, include those words somehow. So I wrote them out and um, included them in that arrangement. And it just, um, it just worked for me. It just worked. It just worked. Um, I don't know if everyone no. knows much about the way these are taken, um, this way of working with the lens of the camera off. That's like, so I think so interesting. Uh, I wonder if that's how you frequently work or how, if that's a newer, or can you talk a little bit about that process and how, you know, how it plays out? Yeah, sure. So um, it's definitely a newer thing for me, it's, but it's been something I've been wanting to explore for a while. Um, and basically I'll explain it. It's, um, I took my camera and, um, and took images without the lens on. I would use kind of like little makeshift lens. I just like cut a little hole in some in some cardboard to give it some focus, but it's it's basically basically like um, photographing without a lens. So for those of you out there who um, take photos, it's like serious no no. <laughs> Going to get dust in your lens and to get it professionally clean. So I've been waiting to do this for a while until um, I got a new camera. So after like ten years with the my same trusty camera was starting to glitch out a little bit and decided great good opportunity for me to this will be my lensless camera now this will be it'll get all dusty and stuff and it'll be fine and um so i was yeah i've been thinking about that process for a while and i um it just really aligned with everything i was thinking in those moments it was it felt very tied to memory fading or becoming something new um and yeah the the timing yeah, worked out. And I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to explore more with that process for sure. It's really wonderful. Thank you for telling us about, about it. I'm so, I've been so curious. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so I think we can open up to questions now. If anyone had questions for any of our artists, you can go ahead and unmute if you'd like. I have a question. I uh, oh, go ahead, Joanne. Doesn't matter. Go ahead, Karen. Go, go, go ahead. Um, I just uh, when we hung the show, we realized that something that unites all of our work is the um, grids that came along, and um, I think I talked a little bit about why the grid was important to me, and I'm curious about everybody else. I saw my saw small skies as being a grid. I had originally wanted to even um, hang them touching like that. I really just saw them very patterned, probably because I've, I've, uh, I've observed other artists doing skies that way. Um, and I liked seeing how the, the subtleties between each one. I thought that was really kind of neat. Yeah. yeah, I love seeing those that way too, Joy. It's really... Um, you really start comparing the skies and then really um, focusing on like the time of day and just those little differences and mm -hmm. really beautiful. And it becomes a patterning thing more than just an individual mm -hmm. uh, object. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I would say mine was just, some of them felt, it was just a little bit of an instinct thing, I guess. Like some of them felt strong and um, strong on their own and others felt stronger together. And I think it was just kind of what felt right for me. It had yeah, a nice I, feeling. It had a nice feeling of a of a window pane as well, even mm -hmm. though the pieces didn't all match up together. Just mm -hmm. it hinted toward this idea of a, a paneled window. Mm. So that's nice. Yeah. I was just gonna say that um, both shows, both Joys and um, the Project Space Artists. Um, are really beautiful together. Um, I was intrigued by, by both both parts of the gallery. Um, one thing I, I I'm not a photographer, but um, since I've been a member of the gallery and have seen um, Lee's work and David's work over the years, um, as a painter, I have really had a whole new vision and insight into what photography can be 
and and I love the painterly qualities of um, your work, both of you. And also um, in David's work, I remember the first time I saw your work, David, when I became a member early, you know, it's almost seven years ago now, I guess, but um, I, I really wasn't even sure what I was looking at. I, I thought I was looking at a, a part of a photograph and a, a collage next to it or something. And it just um, still amazes me how you manipulate the space and the color and the shadows you're talking about. Um, it's, it's truly, I, I think, just beautiful work for both of you. And, and Karen, I don't even know what to say to you. <laughs> You've also influenced my own work because um, although I've, I've always layered things and stuff, I, I feel much braver now having, because it was a hard switch for me from oil to acrylic or flash. Um, but I realize now that I'm having a lot more fun with the um, overpainting and, and, and things start out so differently than they end up. So you, you've given me a lot of courage to um, do a lot more manipulation. So thank you. But both shows are just really spectacular. Oh, and one more thing, I'm sorry, but one more thing is that the way that the project space came together with these grids you're talking about, you know, sometimes we, we divide people's work up and um, uh, the installation committee sort of plays off one piece from another. But I think in this particular show, it's sort of the work itself dictated how it should be hung uh, in these units. And I just, I think it's beautiful. And that's all. <laughs> David, did you plan to have your work hung in a grid or you? Um, I did, the smaller pieces I did. Um, thank you, Joanne, for, for what you were saying. Um, when I saw, you know, when I made the prints and I saw them together, they just fit. Like they have certain kinds of commonality um, in feeling and composition and color. And it's like, oh, you know, these all came out of the same person. <laughs> you know, they really fit that way. So, um, yeah, it worked out really well, I think. It's a, it's interesting. It's interesting to me to see how this group of photographs relates to. I'll call it something painterly and how something painterly is referring to something photographic. You know, it's, it, it's as if someone took all these things and said, all right, you're a painting. So we're gonna make you um, refer to a photograph or someone who's doing a photograph and it's gonna be like a painting. <laughs> and I think that sort of brings the gallery together quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. One other thing I just wanted to add, um, Joy, and I was gonna say this at the beginning, I forgot. Um, I don't know how you do it. I'm an abstract painter, but <laughs> the way that you can bring the light into your work. I mean, I look at those skies um, on, on the, the smaller ones, but in particular, some of your, your larger works in the show. I mean, I can really, like I was looking out my window when you were talking and I could see light behind clouds out my window. And I look at your paintings and I'm like, how does she get that light behind those clouds? You know, it, it's just striking, just absolutely striking. And um, so I just, I commend you. It's just really beautiful work. Thank you, thank you. And your painting. Um, it's a lot of observation. And I also think that's one of the beautiful things about watercolor, you know, as a medium that I think it really is just so perfect for capturing light because it has transparent qualities to it that can be layered. And also it has, um, it has texture to it, texture in the pigment and also the amount of water you put in it and the paper. So all of those things kind of translate to a very sensual quality that I find in light when I walk around. And um, if I start with that, then, then that's what I work with basically. And pretty much every painting is about the light and it's about the subject matter, but it's also about the light in it. And um, it's and very, the, very important. The, the painting with the Black Lives Matter at the top, I mean, I, I find that really a, a beautiful piece. But the more you look at that piece, um, you, have to, you have to spend time looking at it because there's so many 
sections of it that are detailed, like the, the ironwork to the left of that painting. Um, it's, it's delicate, it's there, it's, I mean, um, the color of the, the, the stone. I mean, there's just so much to see in one painting. Um, and so, I mean, when I was at, sitting at the gallery, I, I mean, I spent a long time looking at your work because I thought, oh, I didn't notice that the first time I saw the painting. So there's, there's a lot in each one of them. Yeah, thank you. I spend a lot of time, you know, I, I spend a lot of time drawing these pieces first and, and drawing is very important to me in the, the start of the piece. If, if the drawing is not accurate and that's the best word I could use, you can never put that in later because you can't erase the watercolor. So if it's, if, if you, misshape something, it's gonna stay there. So the uh, while I'm spending you know, a week or so drawing out these larger pieces, it really gives me some time to contemplate, how am I gonna paint this? What am I gonna to attempt to do? What, are, what procedures am I going to follow? What steps do I do? Um, and I'm always surprised because halfway into the painting, most of that goes away and I gotta figure something else out. But, and that's sometimes the, the fun and the challenge of it. But um, there is a bit of a plan I have to, to how you work with it. And, and I don't know that it, I, I wouldn't call it technical. I would call it, you know, um, working with the watercolor, letting it, letting it misbehave, let it, letting it do what it's gonna do. And I think if you look at my paintings, especially if you spend time, you'll see brush strokes, you'll see water drips, you'll see blotches all over the place. And, and actually I love that. And sometimes I force that in the piece. And at the end result, if I, if I do it well, it actually gives a very realistic look to it. And, and you know, people go, it's so detailed. Well, in, in a funny way it is, and in a funny way it isn't. Um, it's just me kind of working with the watercolor and, and usually like a lot of water. And, and I use very heavy paper that absorbs a lot of water in it. So sometimes I got to put it away for a day and let it dry. It's got so much water in it. And um, I think that's just all part of the charm. That's why I love working with watercolor so much. Cool. It's really masterful how you do that. But my question about it is, um, so after you do the drawing, um, I could totally see that you've planned out how you're gonna construct these things because I have no idea how you do it. But <laughs> uh, uh, are you then um, still using your reference or are you yeah. like planning the light um, for how you want it? Like, are you shifting the composition according of, you know, as far as the light and color um, as you go along or is it, um, is it from the reference? I spend a lot of time at the reference stage on my computer. You know, my, I have a large monitor and the image is always up on there. And I'm, I'm generally always looking at that. Um, towards the end of the painting, when I feel like it's almost done, I might not look at the reference that much. I'm looking more at what's on the paper and making decisions at that stage. But um, the composition is determined pretty much at the beginning and it doesn't change. The only time I would change it is if, if sometimes I get to a place and I'm like, oh, I just don't wanna paint that. So I might, pr probably what I would do is blur it out, make it a big shadow or, or make it out of focus or make it ambiguous. There's a, there's a lot of actually ambiguous areas in the paintings that work against the sharp areas to give it a realistic kind of feel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the composition where, you know, where a leaf starts and stops, is pretty much determined from the very beginning of the piece and doesn't change. With that. Jordan, yeah, I, what is your favorite paper to work with? I do Arches 300 pound cold press pretty much all the time, yeah. I've used 400 pounds and I didn't see much of a difference, but um, to me, there's a really big difference between the lighter weight and the heavier weight and um, the result I can get. And also you can, um, it's, it's rather forgiving, you can, you can, uh, you can use harsh brushes, stiff brushes on it to erase areas and stuff. It, and it doesn't really complain too much. Yeah. Joy, Joy, I had a question about journaling. 
And I didn't know, I know some artists write in their journals, some artists draw in their journals, but from what you've said, it almost sounds like your photographs are your journals. Um, I mean, do you have like a system for sketching or how do you sort of approach that? Meaning um, when I'm trying to figure something out? Or, you know, when you're, when you run into something and uh, you're either trying to figure out the composition or just sort of warm up um, until you're actually working. I mean, do you keep a journal? That's sort of what I'm asking. No, it's all photographic. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, I like what David said. Uh, you said something about the rectangle in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's rectangles in my mind. And, and, it, and if it's not the rectangle in my mind, it's, it's, it's the viewfinder in my camera, right. you know? Um, it might be my iPhone, but it, 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 you know, I just use a, a point and shoot pretty much. But, um, and then it's a rectangle on my computer, you right. know, my monitor. Um, but I could come home from, a, if I'm going around, like today I was in Greenwood Cemetery and I came home with a couple hundred pictures. Yeah. Um, and and I, I kept like 15 of them. Mm -hmm. you know they're staying but uh and I'm, i i might not do anything with them i don't know but um so that's i guess how i'm i, I don't really sketch out anything either I, I pretty much go right from the photo i work on the photograph um i use photoshop to sometimes work on some color variations to see some techniques i might want um i can soften areas i can move things around if i want and sometimes i do not a whole lot but um, I'm, I'm figuring it out kind of photographically first. And then I translate it into the painting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lee, I, I wanted to just ask you, um, I was very intrigued when you said you took the lens off your camera and um, made your own lens and stuff. But um, I was wondering like the image that you were shooting, what, what were some of the ideas? That, I mean, what were some of the images you were shooting? Yeah, so the, um, those were actually, all um old pictures so um and i played around with printing things out or making a little diagram like or not that yeah i think diagrams are the word um dioramas that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> um, but then i found the thing that kind of worked the best um was actually just pulling up images on my computer and then you know taking my camera and taking the lens and putting on little makeshift lenses. Um, and they were pictures all kind of during that time and just those, you know, memories that pictures that, you know, I I think back on and and it's funny pulling them up again. It's like they don't always look the way I I'd imagine them in my head too. It's like you 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 forget um even though you have picture evidence sometimes too. <laughs> Well, we're coming up on an hour. If anyone had any last burning questions, we could take one more. That was a great conversation and such beautiful shows and um, just really wonderful to hear from all of you. You did a great job, Kay. Thank yeah, thank no. you, Kay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to share that we do have a closing event for Joy's show um, on Sunday, April 24th from 2 to 4 p.m. Vocalist Mary Catherine Monday will be singing a short program of songs that are actually based on New York City slash around town theme. So we hope you can make it to that. Um, and if you can't come into the gallery to see the show, you can view all of the work on Artsy. And I also wanted to just share that our next show at 440 will be Robin Roy's solo show, um, Short Stories. Robin's here. Um, and then in the project space, a show called Movement with Joanne AC and Juliet Martin and myself, okay, San Antonio. And that will be up from April 28th to May 29th with an opening reception Saturday, April 30th from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, our gallery hour hours at the moment are Thursday through Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 6. And lastly, please tell your friends to apply to our open call for the year, Sequential Synergy, Synergy The Art of Comics. And you can find the prospectus and application at 440gallery.com. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.
and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations, everybody. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you, Kay. Thank Great you. job. <laughs> Great job, everyone. Have a great day.